like you to count the number of Fs in the sentence that's going to come up on the screen. I'll give you about five seconds. Here it is. OK, how many counted three Fs? Four? Five? Good. How many counted six Fs? Awesome. Six is actually the right number. Yep. This, <laughs> this is an interesting example because it shows us how our brain takes shortcuts when asked to solve a problem quickly. This process of taking, paying attention to some Fs while ignoring others is called attentional bias. Until recently, I didn't realize how much biases influenced our thinking and decision-making every single day. And then, a year ago, I had this realization happen to me when I was in Vegas. Yep, <laughs> Vegas. And no, it's not from playing high-stakes poker. My co-founder, Shravani, and I exhibited our new startup, a, 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 a smart safety watch, at the largest tech convention called Consumer Electronics Show. In this show, big giants like Amazon, Google, Apple unveil their latest gigs every year. So being tech nerds ourselves, we were beyond thrilled to be a part of this show. Our booth was in the startup section called Eureka Park. This park got a lot of attention from media and tech enthusiasts because they wanted to get a first look into the new and upcoming. The first day, we arrived at the booth really, really early in the morning because we were excited to get up our banners, our brochures, our swag giveaways because we were so certain that people will be swarming our booths, transfixed and mesmerized and in awe of our cool, new, innovative product. So at 9.30 a.m., people started to pour in our convention center. Our booth was at the very end of a really, really long row of booths. So we waited and waited for people to show up. It was so painful, like watching a slow-mo movie. <laughs> yeah. So as we waited, we watched people pass a couple of safety device booths that were in front of the row without paying much attention to them. Seeing this, I thought, oh, no, that's too bad. Those safety devices must be so boring and mundane. Let them come over to our booth. They'll be just blown away. <laughs> and then they all started slowly coming towards our area, and a bunch of them stopped at a booth that was right across from ours, and this booth had a device that you could talk privately in public settings. And you know what, guys? It looked exactly like Darth Vader mask. <laughs> when I was setting up the booth, I saw this, and I thought, oh, geez, I would rather talk out loud and have people hear my conversation than <laughs> wear that thing and go in public. So when people were checking that out, I thought, OK, they'll be just all over ours. And then slowly, people started to walk over to our booth. And the first thing they could see when they're walking towards our booth is our banner with big, bold letters saying safety on them. So they started reading that sign, and they go, safety? Hmm. And then they just kept walking. They didn't, yeah, they didn't ask what our product looked like, how it worked, what it did, nothing, nada. They just kept walking. Shravani and I looked at each other. And other end were like, what the heck just happened? And then one after the other, person after person, did the exact same thing. We probably got about five people that visited us that first day, and they were more interested in our swag, I mean, because we had fidget spinners. So, <laughs> so the first day didn't go anything like we planned. I mean, I'm smiling about it today, but it was such a disaster. We worked to build this product up so hard made us feel like somebody took a big blow at us. So that evening, we went to the hotel, and we, we reminded each other the passion and the story behind why we built this product, and that gave us a whip of strength. So the next day, we go to the booth, and today we knew we had to come up with a def different strategy to attract people. So today, for the first day, what we did, we just stood behind the booth and then hoped that people will magically show up. So today, we thought, what if we went and stood in front of the booth, showed people our most valuable asset, our watch, and then engaged them in conversation. Yep, exactly like those annoying people in the kiosks at the mall. <laughs> that was the same strategy we used, you guys. And you know what? It worked. When we showed people our device and told them what our product did and that it came with a bonus of safety features, they were beyond thrilled to be 
talking about us. They asked what our story was. They, uh, they gave us some feedback. Using this strategy, we collected about 2,000 contacts that second day, and each and every one of them was interested to buy the watch right then and there. So the show ended up in being an amazing success. But something about that first day kept bothering me. I kept thinking when I got back home, what was it about that first day that made what was it about safety that made people just walk away? I know safety is not very sexy or appealing, but these guys are really interested in tech, and they were not even willing to learn about it when they saw the safety sign. And I remember that first day, I asked a few people that were passing our booth why they weren't interested in checking the device, and one answer kept creeping up. They kept telling me that they wouldn't need a safety device and that they wouldn't be in places where we need it. Initially, when I heard that, I thought, that's just crazy. They're not being logical. But I dug a little bit into the psychology of people, and I found out that each and every one of us make decisions impulsively based on our previous experiences, and it's called unconscious bias. Unconscious bias is a bias that happens automatically, and it's triggered by our brain making quick judgments or assessments of people or situations based on their background or cultural upbringing or personal experiences. But you might be thinking, what does unconscious bias have to do with people leaving the booth when they saw the safety sign? If the people who were visiting that tech show had never been in a situation where their safety was compromised, their brain would never emotionally trigger when they see the safety sign. So rather their brain would go, safety, meh, boring, let's move on to that next gaming booth or that silly looking Darth Vader booth. So that's exactly what was happening. And heck, you guys remember that first day, how certain I was that people will be all over our booth? Apparently, that is another behavior of unconscious bias called overconfidence bias. <laughs> I showed bias that somehow my product was way superior and would attract way more people than those other safety device booths because I didn't have any prior experience or data bringing a safety device into market. Will I do the same thing again? No. So we all think that we are very logical, practical, and impartial people when making decisions, but unfortunately, the truth is we aren't completely rational decision makers. Nobel Prize winning Princeton University professor Daniel Kenman's research suggests that we have two systems of thinking. One is our logical, practical, and analytical system. This is the system we're very aware of, and this system makes amazingly great decisions, but it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and data. The second system is our intuitive system. This is the quick, impulsive, irrational system, and this is a system that triggers our unconscious biases. Neurological scientist Dr. Ernst Poppel of University of Munich calculated that we make about 20,000 decisions every single day. At first, you might think, geez, I don't make that kind of decisions. But if you take a step back and think about it, from the time we wake up, we make a decision if we want to hit the snooze button or turn the alarm off. Or what do I want to eat? What do I want to wear? How do I talk? What do I talk? All these are decisions we're making every single day. And only 5% of all these decisions are made consciously. The rest of the 95% of decisions are made beyond our conscious awareness. This shows us that our intuitive system that triggers our unconscious biases is in control most of the time. But even intuitive system makes pretty good decisions, but at times it will make us do things that we wouldn't otherwise do if we took some time to think about them. For example, have you guys ever done something and later thought, what was I thinking? We all do that time to time. And that's exactly it. We were not thinking consciously. And also, we all think when we talk about biases or unconscious biases, we think it's either pertaining to just race or age or gender, but unconscious biases cover much broader spectrum, and one of those spectrums I'm really passionate about is personal safety realm. Here is a story to illustrate my point. My friend's father was a man who loved biking, and he went on long bike rides every single day. One day, he had a big event to attend, so he had time only for a quick ride. That day, when he was on his driveway, he realized that he forgot his helmet on. As he was very scrunched on time, he made a decision to go ahead with his bike ride without a helmet on. 
because nothing from his previous biking experiences triggered a danger emotion. That same day, another man decided to drink and drive. Their paths met at an intersection and did not end well for either of them. My friend's father sustained a severe head injury and passed a day later, and the driver was put behind bars. Both these men made decisions without considering the risks and consequences. My point from this is that if we're not aware of our unconscious biases and make decisions without being mindful, it could lead to bad outcomes. So how do we unleash the power of mindful decision making? There is three important steps, and it requires a regular practice. First step, awareness. Awareness that this kind of behavior exists is a key. Build breaks in your routine so you don't, you don't go on autopilot mode. So you make decisions aware when you're aware. Second, pause. Take time. Simmer down before you act. Third, identify. Consider the risks and consequences before you make a decision. Let me give you an example that each one of us can relate to so we can take this back, and back home and practice it every day. Let's say you're driving and you hear a text notification on your phone. Be aware of how your hand automatically goes to your phone to grab it and check the text and instantly reply. That's step one. Being mindful of this automatic response will give you some time to think about it. That's step two. Step three, play the risks and consequences in your mind. Think about what if a dog comes in front of my car all of a sudden when I'm texting? Or what if a kid chases his ball and comes in front of my car all of a sudden? Or what if I get caught by a police officer for illegally texting and driving, right? Playing these real life and potential risks will trigger an intense emotion in your brain and your brain will send a signal to your hand saying wait until the car stops. There is much more to learn about how we can minimize our unconscious biases. But we do know that practice of mindfulness is a great tool to recognize and slow down our quick and impulsive decision making that could put our lives in risk or lead us down the paths we do not want to be. While unconscious biases dictate most of what we do every day, we do have the power to take control of them to lead a happier and safer lives. Thank you. Thank you.